Okay, next up, James, uh, James Stevens is a distinguished research fellow at Lilly Research Labs and an expert in drug safety science and the application of systems biology in safety testing. He'll be talking to us about co-expressed gene network analysis as a bridge for extrapolation between species. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me, and I apologize for joining late. I can assure you with a great deal of precision that it was all Land's fault. <laughs> so interesting. Uh, this has been set up pretty nicely by a number of the other speakers who have talked about some of the issues that we have in dealing with complexity. And dealing with complexity has two components, understanding the complexity and then trying to find ways to model it. And on this slide, this is our view of these complex systems. So what we've showing here is the pathophysiological complexity on the bottom of acetaminophen toxicity as an example. We have a reactive intermediate which has a particular chemical structure interacts with proteins that may be damaged and degraded or they may accumulate as this EM of Mallory Denk bodies show in the liver. And at some point you reach a line where you exceed the ability of a cell to adapt and it may die. Once that cell dies, you have a number of decisions that need to be made in the liver. Is it going to repopulate the, is it going to repopulate the lobule by dividing patocytes and then coming back to a normal adaptive state? Or will you actually continue to progress as you go down this complexity of dose and time? If you think about this, it's reasonable to propose that early on some of these responses will be compound specific and will depend on the mechanism by which the compound kills the cell. On the other hand, you can also speculate that, excuse me, that once an hepatocyte is dead, I guess I'm trying to hit, there we go, once an hepatocyte is dead, is it actually sending compound specific signals to the liver or is the liver simply responding to a loss of function? And what I call these are, are these St tissue stereotypic responses, the response of the liver to loss of function regardless of how that occurred or compound specific problems which may have mechanistic information. And which one we're modeling and when it occurs in the course of time is actually really important. And on the top, I'm listing a series of modeling approaches that we're trying to take in a large European consortium called the Translational Quantitative System Toxicology Project where we're using logic-based models which are good at modeling signaling integration over minutes to hours, and then we're looking at some ordinary differential equation-based models of modeling how many cells become hypertrophic or adaptive versus die, some agent-based models, and this is actually taken from a very nice paper from the Pittsburgh group where they've looked at agent-based models to look at development of fibrosis, all the way up to the level of the organ function and how it's integrated in the context of the whole of the whole organism, and you have these decision gates here where a cell actually makes, if you could anthropomorphize, a decision to whether it's going to die or adapt, and then at some point you understand whether the liver function is sufficient to maintain the organism. So we have these massive scales of biological complexity going from everything occurring inside to hepatocyte, hepatocytes plus nonparenchymal cells, the entire organ, dose and time dynamics, as well as pathophysiological -physio complexity. How do we deal with this? We've talked about this a bit. What I'm going to do is try to go through a couple of principles. First, how we've approached modeling this biological complexity using transcriptomics. Transcriptomics, because that's what we know, that's where the data are, but the principles should be able to translate to other omic technologies. Then talk about some molecular pathogenesis applications, uh, excuse me, how we uh, translate that into molecular pathogenesis and how we use it in some applications, and I'll probably have to go very quickly at the end. One of the principles that we've used is if you have few examples and you make many, many measurements, you have two ways to tackle that multiplicity problem. You either increase the number of uh, examples you have or you decrease the number of measurements you make. Evolutionary biologists who use computational approaches to understanding how systems evolve across species recognize, and this is a quote from Gunter Wagner, that biological systems are fundamentally modular. What do I mean by that? If you think about a mitochondria, that's a module of biological function. If you think about endoplasmic reticulum, it's a module of biological function. So how do these very complex small organelles actually achieve that modularity? There must be something that drives that within the system. Well, there are a number of things that one can use. These are called what I call coalescent properties of the system. Protein-protein interactions drive certain types of interaction. Interactions aren't all random. This is related to the sort of the orbitals of complexity that John Wixow talked about. Another property of these systems is that gene regulatory networks function in a coordinated fashion. So co-regulation is highly conserved across biological systems. Things have to happen at the same time in order for mitochondrial biogenesis to occur. If we could use those coalescent properties of the system to form statistical models, 
Statistical models are actually really good at defining the lumpiness in data space, the things that happen in non-random ways. If one does that and creates this modular approach to understanding complex biological systems, and you could take, for example, the 2 times 10 to the fourth genes on an AFI chip, reduce it down to 2 times 10 to the second co-expression modules, you've reduced the dimensionality of the system by 99%, but what you hope you can do is retain the biology. And this is how we actually did that. We started with the drug matrix database that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. It has about 1,000 treatments in it, lots of toxicities, high degree of variability and changes in gene expression. And using a technology or an algorithm called weighted gene co-expression network analysis, what we can do is we can just look in an unbiased way at all that complexity and ask what things tend to change together. So we're asking them to self-assemble into things that have similar behavior across all the complexity in the system. And what you get from that are these gene expression modules. And if you study stress responses, what you'll notice is this is a canonical ATF4-driven nutrient depletion response. But we did not insert that information in a knowledge-based approach into the system to get that. This self-assembled from the fact that an ATF stress response has to be a coordinated response to stress. So it's a self-assembled system that gives you a unit of biological function that you actually recognize. Well, we have 415 of these things. And what we do is organize them in a hierarchical clustering, the way they respond to all the compounds in the database. And you turn the thing inside out, and it looks like a kinase dendrogram. But in this case, the homology in the dendrogram is not driven by the homology of the sequence and the kinases. It's driven by whether the modules tend to change in a similar fashion across all the variation in the system. If it's green, it's down. If it's red, it's up. And this is what we call the eigengene score. And that's simply a made-up gene that approximates the eigenvector that gives you the, the direction of the first principal component of variation. So that's the statistical babble. But we're using one measure of perturbation of the network rather than measures of all the individual genes. That's how you get the dimensionality reduction. So when you see red, it's up. When you see green, it's down. Well, how do we know this translates across other systems? Well, fortunately, we have an entirely separate database built by the National, uh, Japanese National Toxicogenomics Program. And what we see is that 95% of all our modules are preserved. This is one of the advantages of network systems that Lance talked about. You can look at network preservation. Once we know it's preserved, now we can load in all the clinical chemistry data and pathology data and ask the question, uh, what are the associations shown in red in the effect size for association with pathology with the change in gene expression across the data set? Well, if in fact we were correct in our estimation that we could self-assemble the modularity of biological function using co-expression as a coalescent property, then we ought to see those elements of biological function reflected in this dendrogram. In other words, we should be able to track them back to the units of biological function. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. What it simply shows you is I'm looking for enrichment of things like act inside a skeleton, a GoCC term, act inside a skeleton organization, a biological process term. And what you're seeing is they cluster in specific regions on the map. So that says the biology that we know is modular in a cell has organized itself in terms of homology because things that have act inside a skeleton annotation tend to change in a coordinated fashion, which is what you expect if you want act inside a skeleton dynamics to respond to a cellular stress. I think the apt analogy for this is, even though that doesn't look like a liver to you, if you're a trained musician, the notes on the page don't look like music to you either because you can't hear it. But I've studied this thing for about five years, so I don't look at it and see modules. I look at it and say, oh, when LPS, when a liver is treated with LPS, I see downregulation of oxidative stress responses, fatty acid oxidation, upregulation of set of skeletal genes, I see ER stress, I see ribosomes being formed. You read the biology off this using a pattern recognition algorithm that you've learned. And then we try to associate that with, with the pathology that's going on in the tissue. <clears throat> All right, a couple of tough slides. I'm going to try to get through these quickly. On top, that's that LPS treatment. In this case, blue is down, red is up. Genes are, the modules are perturbed in a downward regulation, so we're pressing. Red is up. This is one of those modules. It sits right here. It's very predictive of injury, and it has an eigengene score of four. An eigengene score is a Z-score. 
What it's telling you is how different in this is this in units of standard deviation from everything else I've ever seen. So a z-score of four tells you that this is four standard deviations from the mean of everything else I've seen over, over 4,000 experiments. On the bottom, we're actually asking how much known biology have we captured and how much unknown biology is left to be discovered. And the way we did this was to use, by, to compare a technique called gene set enrichment analysis. Now in principle, all this does is take all the known biologists in the MSIG DB database at the Broad, all the pathways, all the go biological process terms, all the gene sets, and you order your gene expression into a significant p-value and fold change at the top, up, and at the bottom. So everything at the extremes is highly induced or highly repressed. And then you march down the list and you go, gee, in the first 50 genes, I got half the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway. Therefore, I conclude that cholesterol biosynthesis is significantly upregulated. Well, cholesterol biosynthesis actually forms a discrete module based on the statistics of the co-expression analysis. It's module 46. So what we did is compared the GSEA score to the eigengene score of the module which self-assembled as cholesterol biosynthesis, and I think you can see that with a Pearson R value of 0.96, you're getting exactly the same information. Now what does this allow us to do? If the MSIGDB database and everything that's in it represents a map of the known world of biology, how many times does a module from an unsupervised self-assembly co-expression map actually give you the same information that's in the database, and how many blank spots are there? On the bottom, we're not looking at gene expression, we're looking at the Pearson R correlation of a change in a module with anything in the MSIGDB database that's a pathway or a go biological process term. Now, there's a blank spot here. These are changing, the genes are changing, but it doesn't correlate with anything that we've described as being biology. In other words, there's nothing in the known database that replicates that information. So that tells you we have a big blank spot where these are changing. I want you to keep track of that region, which we call C2. So lots of genes are changing. Remember, this was the actin cytoskeleton enrichment that I showed you on the previous slide. But it doesn't actually correlate with any of these known pathway or data, uh, pathway or, uh, uh, data sets. All right, so that's knowing what we don't know modeling biological complexity. Now I'm going to fly through some molecular pathogenesis slides. The real key here is can we then take these modules and can we actually understand something about pathogenesis? This is going to be some more statistical babble. I'm going to try to get through it quickly for you, but it makes a very important point. What we've done is looked at a cluster correlation of different pathologies, and they're coded one, two, three, four because Pathologies can occur uniquely or can they, they can occur with other co-occurring pathologies. So ALT may occur as an ALT rise and only an ALT rise, but it may be ALT plus a little bit of degeneration and necrosis, so we call that level two. Then maybe some biliary hyperplasia, we call that level three. So we have to actually stratify the pathologies because they can occur unique, uniquely and in the constellation of other morphological observations. And what you're seeing is that Many discrete pathologies actually end up making a big smear here at the bottom with lots of off-diagonal correlations. And what that suggests is that they don't look that different. Well, why don't they look that different? Well, we're clustering on effect size. And what you need to understand is that no single gene or unit of genes or module of genes can have a higher effect size than the differentially expressed genes itself. <coughs> When stuff is happening in the tissue, stuff is happening in the transcriptome. So the highest effect size one can find is the fact that stuff is happening in the transcriptome. And because some of these are stereotypic responses that are occurring at seven to 28 days after treatment, a lot of them are the generalized responses of the liver to loss of function. So how do we tease out the underlying structure of that data? What we do is use a technique called logistic regression. The trick in logistic regression is you take discrete data, it did or didn't happen, and then you use the odds ratio that it is or is not going to happen as a continuous variable, and you do, you do regression analysis of that continuous variable, but you can include differential expressed genes as a covariate in the analysis, and you can squelch out or control for, I have this level of significance, 
with this underlying level of gene expression. And now look what happens in this big cluster of things that all look very similar, biliary hyperplasia, I can't read them very well here, single cell necrosis, is which pathology terminology for apoptosis and necrosis. They all split out into discrete clusters, and here's where the driver modules are on the map. So now we're saying we're actually connecting discrete biological processes with discrete pathology outcomes, and if you happen to be the one aboriginal population that can speak a unique language in the Amazon jungle the way I can called WGCNA, you can actually interpret this thing, but I'm hoping that if we put this in the public domain, other linguists will want to investigate this language as well to do molecular pathogenesis. All right, so how do we close the loop? How do we close the loop on the scales of complexity and say, well, look, we've got these self-organizing co-expression networks, and we've got pathology. Do they really connect up in a mechanistic way? This is a set of figures from a review article by Michael Karam, which basically says activation of JNK, June kinase, occurs with just about every kind of pathology from NAFL to NASH to acetaminophen to uh, carcinogenesis. JNK seems to be a very important signal. What's the target of JNK, June kinase? Well, it's C. June. What is C. June? It's a transcription factor. Can we close the loop? If this is true, wouldn't you then expect that you see enrichment of June binding in modules that show a high association with pathology? And that, in fact, does happen. I'm going to go through this quickly. And by the way, I forgot to mention, all these data are published. I'm going to show you a couple things in a minute that are not. If you just search Sutherland JJ and Stevens JL, you get the entire Lilly safety assessment strategy in three papers. <laughs> what we've done is take bile duct ligation as a model, and we've done chip seek for C. June. We're ordering these, we order this as the A branch, the B branch, the C branch, the D branch, the E branch, and we've got them then sorted out here. So if I go forward, you'll see here's this C branch where we had the blank spot but we have the high association with pathology. That's these guys right here. The pink is the eigengene score, the gene expression at one in 14 days, and the yellow is CHIP-seq for C. June in the five prime flanking region of those genes. So in fact, not only can we look at the co-expression modules as a way of reducing the complexity of the system to make statements about biology, but we can actually link the transcriptional events that drive those all the way through to their association with the modules that actually show a high statistical association with the co-occurrence or of, of, of that pathology. This slide I won't spend any time on it, but it just shows you that we can actually predict what might happen in the future. We simply aggregate things that are adverse or not adverse. We say if it didn't happen at day one, what are the modules that are very highly associated with the fact that it might have happened at any time after day 29? A couple of applications very quickly. Can we separate injury signals from tissue stereotypic responses? Can we understand in vitro models, which John Wixwell already mentioned, in translation to human? I love this experiment. This, this, in this experiment, what we did is we did ischemia reperfusion injury of the liver. So two-thirds of the liver has been made ischemic. One-third is non-ischemic. We then close the animal up, and over time, we collect the non-ischemic side and the ischemic side. So rather than having an animal that was dosed and an animal that was not dosed, we got the same liver, half of which was compromised, and, or excuse me, two-thirds of which was compromised, and a third of which was not. And then we collected the transcript profiles of those independently, and what you're seeing in the bottom is the Pearson correlation of the eigengene scores for the perfused non-ischemic caudal versus the ischemic lateral. And what we see is the outliers are the modules that changed in one experiment but not the other, and if we simply substitute the biological responses that are encoded in those, it's RNA processing, nucleospecs, spliceosome, and ribonucleal proteins. That's ribosomal biogenesis. You're upregulating the muscle in that liver cell to do more work on the non-ischemic side. And then if we ask what else looks like that across the database, it's actually partial hepatectomy. However, on the damage side, what we see is another constellation of effects, including ERK, ERK signaling, we see number, uh, protein refolding, module 332 is a heat shock response protein, et cetera. We see lots of things associated with cell injury, and the best comparators in the database are some of the largest, if you'll allow me to call them, train wreck livers that we have. 
But what happens if you look at 24 hours? The ischemic and non-ischemic sides of the liver now show a correlation of 0.84. What does that mean? Within 24 hours, all the injury-specific information has been lost in the dead hepatocytes because they all died within the first 24 hours. And now all you're looking at is the stereotypic regeneration response, which is actually going on on both sides. The non-ischemic side is compensating for the loss of function, but the ischemic side is now kicking in cell proliferation to try to repair. And if you look at these livers 14 days later, the ischemic side looks just like the non-ischemic side. How much compound-specific information are we going to get if we look at a time point where we're only looking at the stereotypic response of the liver? Okay, this is an experiment that John Wixwell talked about. I'm going to go through it very, I actually won't go through this. We're simply saying if we treat putting cells in cultures as a treatment, we look at the underlying module perturbations, what we see is that putting hepatocytes in culture gives you about a three, a three standard deviation perturbation of every, on the average of every single module. Whereas if we say a mouse liver is a treatment relative to rat liver, it's back here. And in this paper, we actually showed that mouse is more predictive of rat than rat hepatocytes are predictive of, of rat. I'm over time. This is the key point I want to make, and then I'll stop. Where we're headed with this is that if we say, what's the probability of getting human liver toxicity if I understand rat liver toxicity, or if I see it? Well, it's a function of the network perturbations. What do I want to know? How much did it change? What's its association with pathology? And is it preserved in the next system of interest? So this doesn't give you a precise understanding of an outcome, but since this is a precision medicine conference, I can precisely tell you what I think the probability is that it will translate across species in a quantitative way. And I do not know of another way we can actually estimate the likelihood of translation across species. If you're interested and you look at this recently published pharmacogenomics uh, journal paper, we've actually applied this then to some human liver samples. So with that, I'm going to finally say that we're trying to put all of these technologies in the public domain so anyone can use them, and I will yield the podium to others and answer questions in the question and answer period. Thank you very much.